Now, Christine, yes. Uh, is there not a microphone? Uh, Signe, can you add in? Yeah. Uh, can you give your microphone here? Because this is a good microphone that's working well. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, I will say, uh, welcome up uh, Gunvor Kronman. Uh, you are the CEO of Hanna Holmen, the Swedish Finnish Cultural Center. And uh, in a way, uh, peace gift, maybe one could say, or something between the countries anyway. Uh, and you're also the chair of the board of Plan International and a board member of Rand Europe, among many other positions. And you have a lot, done a lot of work uh, on issues of strengthening crisis preparedness. Uh, and so you will talk quite soon together with Christine. But uh, meanwhile, I will also say that regretfully, Gunnar Ardelius, uh, who's the secretary general of Swedish Museums Association, uh, he has become ill, so he won't be joining this. But I think uh, this is like come up with you as well. Uh, this is, uh, in one sense, very good because we can focus on all this knowledge that is here. So welcome also, Christine uh, Danielsen. You're the CEO of Arts and Culture Norway, and you're also the chair of the board of IFACA, the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, and on the Nobel Prize. Oh, no. Not, no. Not yet. <laughs> okay, okay. And you have a long, both of you, long experiences within arts and culture and uh, dance, etc. But uh, you will now have uh, a conversation together about uh, cultural preparedness. And it's going to be very interesting to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Bongi. Sometimes when you hear someone saying something not entirely correct about you, it may happen in the future. So maybe at one point I will be a member of the Nobel Peace Committee. You know, it started here. First of all, thank you so much to the organizers for holding this conference. You know, a conference is such a luxury where you can dive into a theme for a full day. But the best thing about conferences is about meeting people, really interesting people. And I'm sure Gunnar is a great guy. I've never met him, but it gives me, you have. He is really cool, and I think you have been sort of a double act before at Albedalsveckan. Yes, so, but the thing is, now we have the luxury of really diving into your background, Gunvor, and you had a brief introduction by Bongi, and uh, I must say, Gunvor has led a really interesting life, so we'll dive into that and we'll talk about the conference theme. And you are Finnish, but you've lived in most parts of the world. And I'm Norwegian, so I might sort of skip into the conversation with some Norwegian perspectives every now and then. So uh, let's go. Okay, let's start with the first question really quickly so we can check the sound. I have been reading your CV, which is very impressive, but it's interesting because you started, I, I would like to call you a, a Nordic nomad. You've been sort of from, from day one, very specific. You, you've studied in Gothenburg, Aarhus. Hang on. Age, it's beautiful, isn't it? Gothenburg, Aarhus, Helsinki, Copenhagen. Did you have sort of a strategic plan to begin with, to be this Nordic nomad? No, I don't think I had a strategic plan, but I think uh, I'm born in 1963 during the Cold War. Uh, Finland was quite a different place uh, when I was studying. Uh, and then all these fantastic Nordic uh, opportunities came with uh, programs like Nord Plus and Nord Job, and uh, I was the first one to jump on all of them. Uh, so, I've been very lucky, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so you started out with taking... A, um, uh, can I just do a quick sound check? Is this too loud? Is it okay? But can you s hear Gunvor? Everything's okay. fine, Kaisa. Okay, cool. Perfect. Just wanted to check. Housekeeping first. So, um, but for your background, and just to do a very brief, you started out as an editor, journalist, and information worker at the Red Cross. You've worked in West and Central Africa, Cote d'Ivoire. You worked internationally, Nordic, and with the Finnish Red Cross. And now, this is very brief, um, you are the CEO of Hana Holmen. And you've been there for more than 20 years. So That's this right. has sort of been an anchor in your career so far. Can you tell us, what is Hanna Holmen? Hanna Holmen is a cooperation center for Finland and Sweden in actually anything that uh, develops our societies together. 
And I think actually the foundation of, of Hannah Holman is very much linked to the theme of our conference. Uh, we're turning 50 as a nation next year, and we have a historian now digging into the archives about all the discussions, political discussions that took place when Hannah Holman was founded in, uh, and opened its doors in 1975. And at that time, uh, foreign affairs and especially security discussions were sensitive in Finland because uh, we were still having the friendship and uh, cooperation pact with the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, the Finnish uh, government very much wanted to have this kind of friendship agreements with Western countries. And Hannah Holman was uh, created in that atmosphere in order to a cultural center where you can discuss anything, uh, debate anything, and very symbolically, the first conference that took place in 1975 was a security policy conference where the neutrality policy of Finland and Sweden was uh, analyzed and, and discussed. So again, culture as the umbrella of creating this space of freedom and uh, yeah, window to the West as it was for, for Finland. Very, yeah. very symbolic, I think, for what we're discussing today as well. So would you say that culture is sort of a safe zone where we can discuss really complicated matters? I think it's, it's a safe, stone, uh, safe, safe, safe zone, uh, but it's also a channel to deal with a lot of different emotions and uh, difficult questions. Uh, uh, just the other day I had a very uh, interesting encounter. Uh, I used to be the chair of a museum in Helsinki called Amos Rex, uh, Contemporary Art Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a young guide, uh, architect student uh, working there who was uh, uh, a climate activist. And uh, his, uh, he, he was having this really difficult time because he felt that everything that he's going to do in his job is going to make the world worse uh, in terms of climate. Mm -hmm. And then he said that every time he comes to the museum, and he goes down uh, and look at the, the collection, uh, he suddenly feels this uh, feeling of freedom, of peace, and it, uh, it just creates some peace of mind for him. Uh, and I think th that is somehow the sort of existential essence also of uh, what art and culture can do to human beings in, in, uh, in difficult situations, how it helps you to cope with things. There's a lot of research about health and, and, and art, how that can be used, and we don't have time to go into that. But I think this uh, existential uh, aspect of arts and culture as part of resilience mm -hmm. and uh, the strength it's building in individuals. I must say, uh, I was teaching uh, two years ago uh, for half an year in uh, Italy at the European University Institute and I had several students from Ukraine uh, and they were all talking about this same thing. How, uh, how the language, many of them were Russian speaking originally and they were really struggling now to become as good at the Ukrainian language because it was difficult for them, some of them to continue with the Russian language, but also the culture how that safe space that it created for them uh, in very difficult times. Mm. So, and again, resilience as a consequence of that, uh, uh, building the morale, building the identity and, and so on. Mm. So the whole idea of the role of culture yes. and art in, uh, yes. in times of conflict. Yes. Could we reflect on some of the things that we've heard today? Because yes. we had an, a really interesting introduction by Frederic Rousseau mm. and he introduced the alliances, the yes. Euro-Atlantic alliance yes. versus the Russian alliance. Yes. And where I can see Norway as very much part of the Euro-Atlantic yes. alliance. Whereas when, when we discussed over lunch, you said that the, the, the sort of very specific Russian strategy of safeguarding traditional cultures, history, cultural heritage as part of a security issue. Yes. You felt that you could connect with that yeah. from a Finnish perspective. Yes, that's, that's right. And actually, I don't know if Frederick is there, but thank you. I think it was a great analysis. It really put some things in, in my head in, in place. And I could, I could connect with that from a Finnish perspective. 
Uh, of course, geopolitics matters always, uh, and, uh, and history matters always. Uh, and I think, and maybe we come to that a little bit later, when we maybe compare countries a little bit, how you actually do regard culture as part of the, the total defense or, or, or the, the resilience of a nation. But I think that in Finland it has been and still is um, maybe a little bit more anchored than, than in some of the other Nordic countries uh, as a natural part of uh, the nation building and the morale and uh, the sort of uh, shared history and memory that, uh, that one shares and, and, and builds uh, also a security policy uh, from. Yeah, and you also said uh, you also said that maybe the Baltic nations mm. might feel more connected to the yeah. Russian. I, I don't want to talk for Baltics. I know there are many here, but I would love to in the break maybe to hear from some of you. But I imagine it's so. And and uh, you know, I was thinking of, for example, how the the song festivals uh, manifested this uh, nationhood and identity and. Uh, the belonging and the togetherness uh, in a fantastic way. And I remember this last, uh, just before uh, I think the Baltic uh, states got their independence, the punk concert in, in Tallinn. Uh, that was very legendary. I think you, you all heard about it and seen it. Mm. It's quite something. I'm just interested in, in debating that because in the Nordic countries we tend to uh, be similar. But mm. I also find it very interesting when we are different. Mm. Because from a Norwegian perspective, I mean, this morning we heard the minister mm. saying that it had been a wake-up call with mm. the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And we heard her very explicitly say that culture and cultural heritage is vital as mm. part of national security plans. And for a Norwegian, I can see that we're not yet there. Uh, mm. We have different plans within cultural heritage, mm. museums, libraries and archives, but we do not see them rooted in national plans or regional or local mm. plans. So I would say that we are sort of very much on this Euro-Atlantic alliance, whereas yeah. Finland might be uh, more used to this. Mm. So what's your analysis? Is this, has it always been like this in Sweden? Uh, well, m m of course, I work with Sweden uh, since 20 years on a daily basis, so I follow it very clearly. I think if you go two, three years back, this was not on the agenda in Sweden at all. Uh, I remember uh, giving a speech in Eskilstuna in, in a conference called uh, uh, Folkokultur uh, about uh, cultural resilience and, and uh, civil defense. and. Uh, my impression was that many thought it was a very weird team to, to talk about in a cultural conference. Uh, but my God, how much has happened in Sweden since it's, I must really say I'm, I'm impressed. And something that we talk about in Finland quite often is that, you know, Sweden is going to go far ahead of us <laughs> from Finland very soon if they continue with this pace. But there is an interesting difference in the way, uh, at least for now, uh, the theme is approached in Sweden because it's very much focused on the cultural heritage and the material uh, part of it. Whilst in Finland, maybe it's more also on the sort of um, uh, non-material part and also from an economic point of view, when you talk about uh, a sector that actually also is a big employer uh, and matters financially for the country. I think in Finland we talk about some 200,000 people that are employed in the sector, so it's a vital part of the economy as well, and we all know that in crisis situations, uh, economy is also extremely important. Mm. And I think that's interesting to, to sort of widen that perspective mm. in this conference as well, that mm. cultural heritage is, is obvious, it's, yes. it's very... You can see it, uh, mm. you know, there are archives mm. and libraries and galleries that we have seen today that have been destroyed, mm. whereas living arts mm. um, and performance arts that we mm. just saw an example of from, from Pussy Riot mm. is also a big part of creating these national narratives. Yes. And I think that has been also a thread today that mm. it's... <laughs> It's also a bit saddening because uh, some of the speakers have said that there's mm. a lack of logic. It's about creating a narrative that fits the purpose. And I, I find mm. that frighteningly scary. 
Mm. And, and how would you say that the narrative, back to, I just, I don't want to leave the alliance of the mm. Euro-Atlantics mm. and the Russians, where you feel that Finland and maybe the Baltic states will recognize the mm. Russian strategy. Why is it different in Finland and the Nordic states than, for instance, in Norway, where I'm from? Well, as I said, it's all about geopolitics and history. Uh, if you've been fighting for your freedom several times, uh, and it's very close in, in history, uh, you have it in the backbone, I think. So, in, in a way, I think it's very easy. Uh, if you have to, to really fight for your nationhood. Uh, also, it's interesting, you know, if you think of how Finland built its identity after independence, where really, and I think that's maybe also one of the explanations why arts and culture in, a, in some way has been part of the, the wider security uh, picture also is that design, architecture, uh, modern art was very much at the heart of the nation building in the, in the 50s and the 60s. And it also actually put Finland on the map globally uh, as a nation mm. uh, with, with artists like uh, Timo Sarponeva and, and, uh, and many others. Uh, so I, I think, yeah. Mm. We are products of our history and our geopolitical situation. Yeah, and that's interesting because what also Rosen said, Frederick Rosen, he said that in the Euro-Atlantic sphere, mm. you will find culture and cultural heritage. That's an issue for the cultural sector. But may I ask you one question? Yeah. Because yeah, of uh, course. when I, I was reflecting on Norway, when we you know, listened to Frederick, and also Norway is, as an independent nation, uh, young. Mm -hmm. uh, but why don't you have the same situation? Well, it's a paradox, <laughs> isn't it? It's interesting because we were an independent nation in only in 1905, uh, relieving us from the Swedes, and then before <laughs> that, the Danes. And it is interesting because I feel very strongly as, as a representative of the cultural sector that, um, that it is an issue for the cultural sector to take yeah. care of our cultural heritage yeah. and to take care of our living arts. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is on the forefront of a national strategy, like we heard Lilia Strand say mm -hmm. this morning. And, and, and why? I don't know. Maybe we have, um, uh, we have too strong um, a belief in the, uh, the NATO alliance and in mm -hmm. the US coming to save us. Mm -hmm. uh, and also during the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, the Norwegian royal family and also most of the people working in the civil service, they went to London. And for instance, the Arts Council of Norway, where I'm mm. head now, it was a blueprint of the Arts Council of England. So it could be sort of, um, a dependency um, mm. or a belief. And it's also interesting because we're not even a member of the EU. Mm. So I don't know, we're a different country <laughs> in this alliance. So it's, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's interesting with the Nordic differences. How, however, having said that, it's obviously been a huge wake-up call also for mm. the Norwegian government to see what's happened in Ukraine. It's very close to us. And, you know, we are present here at this conference and we're debating this. Mm. So most certainly we feel in our organization that we need to see uh, culture and cultural heritage as part of national strategic security issues. So, well, well thank you for taking the interviewing role uh, for a second <laughs> there. Uh, but if we look at uh, safeguarding, protecting cultural heritage as not an issue simply for the cultural sector, mm. this is what the Hana Holman Initiative is all about, isn't mm. it? Because mm. that is cross-sectorial. Can you tell us how you've designed that program? Yeah, uh, well, the Hannah Holman initiative uh, was an initiative that was born during COVID times. Uh, and then you remember uh, borders closed, uh, nations started to look very much inwards. And uh, as a center that uh, fosters and tries to deepen the relation between two countries, of course, our mission was quite difficult at that time. And, and in fact, because Finland really literally closed down, we also had to close down and uh, I had to lay off all my staff, including myself, uh, asking myself, why on earth do you need a center like this when the whole world is in crisis? And uh, then we started to, to dig into how have Finland and Sweden actually acted in previous crises? Have we been talking to each other? Have we taken advice to, from each other? Have we helped each other? Mm. Have we actually uh, found out what are the consequences of national decision-making 
on the other nation uh, when, before we make the decision. And uh, we looked at the refugee crisis, we looked at forest fires and, and many other crises. It was too sensitive at that time to really talk about the COVID because the, sit the atmosphere between the countries was very, very quickly deteriorated, mm -hmm. uh, which shocked me actually that that is how quickly it can go when uh, even if you are the best neighbors in the world, uh, you can also become uh, not enemies, but uh, not on very good terms with each other very quickly. And um, then uh, we presented this analysis to the Finnish Security Committee, which is the coordinating body for all security actors in, in Finland. And uh, they actually said that this is worthwhile uh, trying to develop. So we. We went to the, the Swedish uh, Defense uh, University and asked if they would join in developing a concept, which they did. And uh, what we did was that we developed a concept where we tried to get all sectors in society uh, together uh, to look at uh, potential scenarios that uh, we could have in the future uh, where crises are uh, not only limited to, to one nation, uh, and, um, and then simulate how would we act in that situation. And there were actually two aims of this. The one uh, aim was that unless a colleague doesn't know his or her colleague in the other country, the threshold to very quickly uh, phone at 11 o'clock in the evening, uh, not only that it's difficult, you probably don't have the person's mobile number in your phone either, and you don't know the name of the person, uh, so it's easier to, to not do that. So we wanted uh, colleagues to get to know each other uh, at a personal uh, level. Secondly, uh, what we wanted was to, through the simulations, because the participants are uh, leading persons within their own sectors, uh, identify gaps in competencies, in coordination responsibilities, in uh, legislation maybe, uh, or in uh, decision making. So uh, we are now into the third year uh, and the third round, and every course uh, presents in, way w w in, a, in a way in the end of the course to the authorities of our countries. These are our reflections and observations from these exercises that um, uh, actually we, we should appoint this person to have this responsibility because in our neighboring country they have it and we, we actually also need it. Or, that we actually have an obstacle in our legislation that doesn't allow us to, to work together uh, efficiently and so on. Uh, the interesting re uh, reflection we did after the first course was that uh, we assumed that uh, people coming from leading positions in their own country would know their own country's preparedness systems. <laughs> that was not the case at yes. all. So we have actually changed the content of the course to start with uh, actually knowing your own system, the basics of your own system. Uh, and um, I'm very excited actually that I know some of the people here will attend the next course uh, starting in the autumn. Did you see any dilemmas? Any things that you had not foreseen during this? Because this is still a pilot going on yeah. the third year. Well, I think the, the biggest surprise was this, that we assumed that people were more knowledgeable than they were. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the, the, the real uh, insight. Uh, we have now also presented the initiative um, for um, member countries in, in the European Union, which we did in, in, in January, and um, very good response. And uh, also uh, working very closely with NATO to align with NATO's re resilience concepts. Uh, I think the other observation was, and, and uh, I know that that is a challenge also now at the EU level, because uh, President Niedinster, uh, the previous Finnish president, is actually uh, doing some research now for Elizabeth, uh, Ursula von Leyen, or whoever it will be after her, uh, on how the European civil defense uh, should be developed collectively, is that uh, words like civil defense, resilience, um, total defense, we have very little consensus of what we mean with the, uh, by mm -hmm. these words. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say when we did our uh, first study between Finland and Sweden, this was actually the 
biggest obstacle in the start, before we started the program, to agree what are we actually talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Finland and Sweden, yes, we have some kind of consensus now. European level, not at all. That's really interesting to see how language really plays a, yes. a really important yes. role. How can you see this program expanding? Because I see the Hannah Holman Initiative is an actual answer to... Uh, oh, hello. Hello. I have lots of things <laughs> going understand. on here. Uh, <laughs> it's an answer to the Euro-Atlantic uh, sort of lack of knowledge on how authoritarian states are really specifically targeting culture and cultural heritage. Can, can this be expanded? Can this grow? Yeah, I think it can. Uh, I think it should not be expanded on the expense of the practical uh, experiences that we're making, because that's really what makes a difference in real life. Mm. Can mm -hmm. I ask one last question? Yes, I yeah. think so. This yeah. is why I'm coming up. Just say maybe the last question. Yeah, I just so wanted to sort of break well. zoom out from the Nordics mm -hmm. and, and go into another conflict that we haven't really touched upon today. We've been in Syria, we've been in Iran, we've been in Afghanistan, we've been in Ukraine, but we haven't been to the Middle East. But you have a very strong heart mm. for the Middle East mm. and uh, you're married to a Palestinian mm. and you have a home in Jerusalem and Ramallah. Can you s just reflect finally on what is, I mean, we see devastating images every day mm. from this conflict going on as we speak. Mm. Um, how can culture and cultural heritage play a part in such a toxic clash of narratives as we see? In the Middle well, East now. Culture does play a part, and uh, apart from all the loss of lives, of course, the enormous loss of uh, cultural heritage that has taken place in one of the oldest cities in the world, the city of Gaza, is absolutely devastating. Uh, we don't have time to go into that, but uh, the silence of good people is also um, an issue here on, on this matter, I would say. Uh, but culture does uh, give hope, um, food, traditional dancing, poems, uh, art. Uh, my husband and I, we organized a, a art exhibition uh, a month ago for, uh, with Gazan artists. Uh, that was a, a very big thing in Ramallah for, for people to be able to see that, yes, this is a, a living culture still. Uh, not everything is gone. Uh, it gives a lot of hope. Thank you. It's the fabric that keeps us together. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, both Christine and Gunvor, so much for this. And oh, thank you.